Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Lott and Nick Anderson, take it away. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. Uh, We're here today to talk about regulatory and reimbursement. As Joe says, uh, what does Joe say? What did you say? Two great tastes that taste great together. There you go. But they don't usually taste great together. Mm -hmm. They're more like oil and water, aren't they? Or are you here to tell us different? Most people aren't thinking about them at the same time. That's for sure. And then what they think will work for one, they think is going to work for the other. And that's not true. So that's, that's what we're kind of here to explore today. Okay. Explore away. So in your world, Nick, what is regulatory to you? Where does that come into play? Good question. And oh, wait. First, first off, for those of you who don't know us, I'm Michelle. I'm in regulatory, and this is Nick. And Nick is an expert in reimbursement. Nick and I work together, but again, we are on kind of opposite ends of the spectrum of bringing a device to market. Michelle, on one hand, lives in a fully furnished home, and. Uh... <laughs> Nick, what's going on here? Yeah, we're we're moving. It seems right like after we this call, you're going to pick up those boxes and carefully place ukuleles. Yeah, <laughs> those are full size guitars. This room's just huge. Oh, okay. Those are really far away. <clears throat> no, we um we're moving. We we're getting a different place a few miles from here, and moving day is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. So, do you need a little bit more space these days? Yeah, we're having because. a. We're having another puppy in a month, a human puppy. So we need a little bit more room. Um, and we don't they, know what it is yet, people, so don't ask me. We don't know. We like the surprise. We've done that with all of our other kids and keeping with that tradition. So to answer Michelle's question, um, you know, what what is regulatory to a reimbursement guy? I've said this, and let me say something very forcefully at the top of this meeting is that, um, how do I say this? Regulatory for me it may as well be a different, in a different galaxy. It doesn't make any difference as far as reimbursement is concerned, other than essentially a box check. Are you FDA cleared or FDA approved? Have you gone through the appropriate regulatory bodies like CLIA, if you're a diagnostic test, laboratory developed test? that in that regard, I am more than comfortable if somebody comes to me and says, well, Nick, I've got a 510K product. Uh, we did class two or we're a PMA or we're a laboratory developed test or whatever. You know, what, what do you think? And I go, I don't know, go talk to Michelle. I'll do exactly what Joe does and say, I, I'm not a re regulatory guy. So you could think of regulatory and reimbursement running in parallel because there is a lot that you can do that would appeal to payers at the same time that you can do things that would appeal to the FDA. But <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I, I frankly don't know the last time I asked a company their regulatory status. It just doesn't make any difference for most reimbursement. Now, Medicare, you know, we can talk about some details, but but I'm already making the assumption, you've already spoken with Michelle, you've already got regulatory clearance, or you're going to in the next 12 months or whatever it is, but really it doesn't make any difference as far as I'm concerned with, with strict reimbursement. So I think, Michelle, during this, I might double talk a little bit because it, you can't get reimbursement, and it wouldn't matter even if you did, if you didn't have FDA approval clearance. It's right. kind of like, it's a, by the time people get to you, it's a foregone conclusion that they've gone through uh, yes. the regulatory path. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I, I still get people that will say, you know, Nick's a regulatory expert. And it'll sound like, I think some people get, you know, reimbursement and regulatory mixed up, which is the purpose of this conference today. And I'm like, I don't know hardly anything about regulatory. I mean, I know enough, like they say, to be dangerous. I, you know, I know class two versus a class three, you know, I, that type of stuff. But that's not my world. That's Michelle's. So. And then vice versa, I know enough about reimbursement to know when my clients are talking crazy. 
And I'm like, I, I, I know enough to say, well, I, I, that's not how it works. Talk to Nick. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping to dispel some, some common myths um, here today. This is the part where I interject how happy I am because I think you guys met through me. Uh, that is true. And we also need to call out the appearance of Michelle's Lean RAQA mug. I've never seen that before. I don't know where you got that idea. Cheers. Uh, I, I hired this marketing guy that's pretty mm -hmm. smart. Mm -hmm. Those of you on the call who don't have your own branded mugs, what are you waiting for? We're on camera all the time. Michelle, take it away. So, so Nick, um, let's talk codes. In, in my world, there is a product code, which is a three-letter code that already exists from the FDA, and you have to find which of these product codes best describes your product and its intended use. Now, on, on rare occasion, you can have more than one product code if you're combining existing technologies and you're not creating new risks or new intended uses. But I, I have customers that think the product code that they choose for the FDA somehow is linked or informs their reimbursement in their next steps. And they, are, they have dictated to me, like, oh, Michelle, I don't want to use that product code, even though it's not only the best fit, but the easiest regulatory path. Because they're like, no, I want a de novo so that I can say I'm this brand new thing and, and get a new code. And at that point, they're not talking about reimbursement. They're, 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 they're trying to make the link between how they got FDA clearance to what they're going to be eligible for in reimbursement. And then I've also seen people say, oh, I looked up devices that were cleared under this code, and I don't like how they're reimbursed, so I'm not going to let you submit a 510K under that. And I'm like, that's not a thing. No, you're exactly right. So, um, again, I don't, I mean, I've had, when I say consulting, I mean, that could be anywhere from a little 20-minute phone call all the way through a big engagement or something, hundreds of companies. And I've never once asked them what their regulatory product code was so that I could best assess what their reimbursement strategy should be. That, like I said, they're in, they're in semi-different universes. So let's say that a company comes to you, Michelle, and they get a 510K um, de novo, whatever it is, you know, you, again, I don't even know the vernacular, you would know that better. And you say, guys, here's what you are. I just called the FDA. We did all the stuff. We did the trial that the FDA would require for this distinction. And you're good to go. As far as the FDA is concerned, you can start marketing your, your product. And if that company did, and many, many, many of them do, um, they're going to hit a brick wall first with coding, our code. <clears throat> excuse me, CPT, DRG, ICD-10, HICPICS, uh, APC groupers, you know, all, all of the reimbursement coding world, then they're going to hit a brick wall with coverage, and then they're going to hit a brick wall with payment, possibly, right? I'm, I'm going to give a, a verbose example here, but when they come to me, the first thing I would say is, okay, let's talk about coding. What codes do you think you're going to use? Well, if they have this new medical device, some new, you know, stent or catheter or whatever this thing is, I'm going to say, okay, tell me about it. How is it used? And they say, well, we're going to sell this to the hospital. Um, the hospital is going, all the physicians in the cardiology unit are going to use it. They implant it in the patient's neck. The bill goes to that patient's insurance company. And by the way, there's already a CPT code for this. And I go, know that there's a CPT code for the implantation of a device in the patient's carotid artery. And they go, yeah, we're, we're, that's what we are. And I say, yes, but is that code set up to reimburse for your product? Because an insurance company is going to say, yeah, we know about it, carotid artery stenting, but we know about Smith and Nephews and Boston Scientifics and Medtronics, you know, St. Jude's device, not yours. Yours is brand new. And secondly, do you have a HICPICS code? HCPCS, that's how we're going to get reimbursed for buying your thing, 
not just for implanting it. CPT code is for the procedure. HIPPIX code is for the device to get reimbursed for the purchase of the, the actual unit. And so, uh, Michelle, you and I have talked about this. The, the strategy in which a company should go about getting a HIPPIX code is crucially important. So I was involved with a company a while ago. We ended up getting a HIPPIX code. And <clears throat> in my mind, under the assumption that in parallel with getting the new HIPPIX code, so that when the physician spends $100 on this, they can bill and get reimbursed for this, not just for the implantation of it, that the clinical trials we were going to do at the same time the HICPICS code application was going to go through would be done at the same time. Forgive the terrible grammar in that. You have to get a HICPICS code. Well, that's a plenty of time to get a clinical trial going so that when you are granted the new code by CMS, you have the evidence that warrants the reimbursement of that code. Um, if you don't need a HICPICS code, don't get one. And there's rationale about how you go about choosing whether or not you need a new product code. But I hear that stuff all the time where companies will say, you know, we're good, we already have a code. Well, no, Smith and Nephew and Boston Scientific and those guys that have done the research to show that that code is worth reimbursing, they've done the work, but you haven't. You're a brand new product. So an insurance company will have that code, either a CPT or HICPICS code or whatever, in a big book of uh, HICPICS codes, HICPICS level one or level two, and they're going to take each of those codes and they're going to set it up in their system as covered, possibly covered, or not covered. And when your product code comes through, excuse me, let me use, when your HICPICS code comes through, sorry, Michelle, that on that, when that happens, <clears throat> excuse me, the insurance company is going to say, well, what is this? And they're going to say, oh, it's the Nick Anderson carotid artery stent. And they go, we've never heard of that. This is set up to be covered for the Medtronic Smith and & Nephew and Boston Scientific stent, but not the Nick Anderson stent. He hasn't done the work. Denied. And then the bill goes back through the system and everyone gets mad at you because you didn't do the proper studies to warrant reimbursement for that code. So I don't know if I made that any clearer or any, any dirtier, but it, it's... The product code you get from Michelle and the reimbursement code that Nick will help you navigate, two totally entirely different things, and one doesn't have a bearing on the other. You get your barrier and more expensive. Say that again, Joe, sorry. You just, you, you didn't make it murkier, you made it scarier and more expensive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not to sound pejorative, but welcome to MedTech. I mean, you, you've got to go sit down with Michelle and she's going to say, okay, tell me what you got. And I'll say, I have this thing and it goes up through the femoral artery into here and does this and this and this. And she'll go, great. I, I have a schematic in my brain of what you're going to need to do to get the FDA to say, yes, you can now begin marketing your product. Then after that, you or during that, you should go talk with Nick and Nick's team and Nick's friends and all that. And we're going to help you figure out, okay, fine, if, if Michelle said you're a PMA, fine, you're a PMA. What did Michelle tell you you need to do for clinical trials? And they'll say, she told us about 100 patients uh, in a cohort study. And I'll say, oh, it's going to be enough for reimbursement. Because that might be enough to get the FDA to, to sign, a, you know, letting you go to market, but that might not be enough for Cigna and Aetna and Blue Cross, who are your customers. And getting reimbursement is not a universal, I'm reimbursable, it's I'm reimbursable here, here, and here, but these guys said, no, I, don't ex I can't explain it, and I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, so depending on your product, if your product is primarily in a disease that is the Medicare population, 65 and older type product, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, whatever, then without a doubt your primary customer is going to be Medicare. Well, that's a different game. we got to play that game. How do we get you a local coverage determination with Neridian and Novitas and CGS and WPS and FCSO and all of that? How do we get you a national coverage determination so you're covered across the entire United States for Medicare? Well, then we have to talk about commercial payers. 
Now we got to go to Aetna, then we have to go to Cigna, then we have to go to BCBS. You confused me there. When you said 65 plus Medicare, isn't Medicare a guy to convince? You just mentioned like 10 other names that I haven't heard of. I know. When everybody on this call, when you get a minute, go to Google and type in CMS space MAC map, M-A-P, Medicare CMS map, and um, Mac, Mac map, excuse me. So these Macs are private companies. I don't know how many people know this. Medicare is uh, adjudicated by 12 private companies. So it's not the government in Washington, D.C. when Nick Ander, well, when my grandfather's claim comes through and it goes to the government, it's not that. It goes to a private company. Since I live in Utah, I'm in the Neridian Medicare group. Uh, if you live in Florida, you're in the FCSO group. And if you're in the U.S. Virgin Islands, you're in the FCSO group. So a physician in Miami that treats a Medicare patient, that bill will go to FCSO. And, and a medical director at FCSO is going to say, wait, what is this thing? I've never heard of intracarotid stenting for an 80-year-old with asymptomatic, you know, whatever. <clears throat> then they'll do a health technology assessment, and that one payer group, just FCSO, which is Florida and the U.S. Virgin Islands, they will determine if Medicare is going to reimburse for that, just for that jurisdiction. Well, that's one jurisdiction. Now, it's a big one. Most Medicare patients live in Florida. But you've got to go rinse and repeat that 10 other times, 11 other times in each jurisdiction of Medicare across the United States. Unless you can get a national coverage determination, an NCD, one big blanket one. But that's major. To get an NCD is very, very difficult. And if you're a screening or diagnostic test, it's even harder. That's just medical. That's just medical. I'm going to say two, three things. One is shout out to Rick who found that link. I just shared it with everybody. Uh, and second is we better talk a little Michelle stuff because the questions are coming in fast and furious about reimbursement. I mean, yeah, I mean, they taste great together. Mm -hmm. She's more of like the peanut butter and she's more the chocolate, I think. <laughs> That's my energy. So um, I, I want to back up a little bit because you, you mentioned uh, evidence and data a, a, a couple of different times. Um, and we talk about this a lot together, is at the point of the FDA and any data that the FDA is going to ask for, it's purely to demonstrate safety and efficacy and clinical benefit. It has nothing to do with a reimbursement model, with a healthcare economy, with anything that you need to prove to any of these payer organizations that Nick talked about. So I have had customers that are so in love with their own science and technology, they have been just blind and are shocked that the FDA even asked for like a small 20, 50 patient study. And then they think that, um, that okay, they got, that, that, okay, if they're having trouble swallowing that the FDA wants to see data on 20 patients, what do you think? the reimbursement guys are going to ask for. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it may be orders of magnitude different than proving safety and efficacy. And supposedly, there, in 2011, FDA opened up a new pathway to kind of try to parallel path technology with, uh, where you start the conversation with FDA and CMS simultaneously so that you build a study that can hopefully uh, kill two birds with one stone. But I've heard very little out of that pilot program um, since it started. And, uh, and again, you're trying to prove two, two very different things, so it's very hard to build those same outcomes into a single, a single study. Something you said uh, that made me think, it, it sounds to me as though FDA doesn't care how stupid your idea is as long as it doesn't hurt people and is safe. Correct. So you can get something approved that has no chance of commercialization. Let me show you have some kind of clinical benefit, that there's an actual need. Yeah, I get that. But they might say, you know, there are 10 other guys doing this. Then I, I don't care. They won't say that specifically. But 
they don't even they, they they have no interest in your commercialization plan if your device makes sense if anybody will pay for it that that's not in their wheelhouse at all you know the example that i give joe i've given this during the 10x med device conference that i'll talk about you know how many of us when we go buy a new car we go down to the car dealership and we see a new Toyota Corolla and we look at the sticker in the window and it says 29, uh, 29 highway and 25 city MPG. How many of us actually believe that? And what I end up, you know, it's funny because all I've asked groups worldwide that question, you know, and it's like whatever the equivalent of a sticker is in Dubai, but I'm like, everyone has these in the car window and none of us believe them. My house right here is at 4,800 feet altitude that I have a car seat in there. I have my windows rolled down with my air conditioning on. Um, you know, I, I have drag because the windows are down on and on and on. There's not a rat's chance I'm going to get 29 MPG on the freeway. I'm going to get 25, 24 maybe. Um, that I take that sticker in the window as just kind of a baseline idea and then I discount it for where I live. If I lived at sea level and I didn't have a car seat and I never rolled down my windows with the air conditioning on, that'd be a different story. Well, that's the EPA. It's the, it's the car equivalent of the FDA in humans. And literally how they do that, how they determine this, is they take your car and they put it on rollers they make Toyota do it. They blow a fan at 65 miles per hour at the radiator, and they turn on the car, and they collect the exhaust out the back and so on and so forth, and that's how they determine miles per gallon. That is not what we would call in health economics and reimbursement and all this real-world evidence. It's mm -hmm. not. That's an FDA trial. So when Michelle says you need to go do 10 patients, and here's what that will look like, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you design those types of studies or if there's some framework, but you say, guys, I think you're going to need to do 10 patients. That is in the most 65-mile-an-hour uh, fan blowing on a roller that I can think of in the medical world. And then I take that and I go, guys, that's fine. If that's what you needed to do to get, re to get regulatory, now let's go do a systematic literature review, a big $50,000 project. Let's go pull all the literature and let's see what's actually getting reimbursement. Oh, lo and behold, it's not 10 patients, it's 7,000 prospective over 36 months. You know, that's a big difference from what the FDA needed to see. Um, you know, all of us, when we go buy a car, you go to Edmonds, you go to Car and Driver, because you want to see the real world evidence, the RWE. You want to see how that Toyota Corolla actually performs on the road and with an actual driver with actual wind with the windows down and a car seat and obese and everything. That's what I want to see when I go buy a new car. So it's, it, it, is, it is a very good analogy for the difference between the clinical trials that you would have to do to get regulatory FDA, EPA approval versus what you have to do to get Edmonds and Car and Driver, meaning Cigna and Aetna, to sign off and say, hey, now we're talking. You guys actually took this device out of the perfectly perfect, perfect FDA trial world, and you went and did it with a CRO, a contract research organization. You went and did it in 900 patients, prospective, randomized over five years, and you showed extraordinary outcomes. That's real world evidence. I encourage everyone on the call now to type in the word applause for Nick because you are the best analogy giver I know. Seriously, you have an analogy for everything and you make it so easy to understand. So, Thank you. On behalf of the office, applause, applause, applause. <laughs> they love you, Nick. No, thank you. They have a couple you. offers here of helping you move, actually. So people well, hey. they can help you move. I'll take I'll take any help we can get, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't I, I got to say this again that does not detract from what you have to do with Michelle, and if nobody nobody's board of directors is going to say okay Michelle what do you think and Michelle says ten patients and they go great let's do a thousand, you know everyone wants the bare minimum let's just check the FDA box let's get that over with then we'll deal with. Nick Anderson and his payer shenanigans. 
Um, and I can't fault companies for that. At least you got FDA clearance. The share price goes from a dollar a share to four dollars a share instantaneously, even though you're still not ready to go to market, even though legally you can. So I'm not saying if Michelle tells you 10 patients in your study that she's wrong. No, Michelle is playing in that perfect world, right? Michelle, that's you're telling them the correct thing. Let Nick go do his thing. I'm doing my thing for regulatory. Yeah. We have our first contestant on the Nick and Michelle show. It's Jonathan Saul. His mic is open, his camera is not. Hi, John. Good morning. Hi. So I have a couple questions. Um, I, I appreciate the analogy, but I would love to hear a story about somewhere uh, or some time where the two of you work together with a product uh, or device um, that achieved that success, that went directly to the thousand person um, alignment uh, because they had either the capital to do that or they had the foresight to say it's worth uh, making those steps um, in advance. And then the other thing that I was hoping to understand is just to have some kind of framework to uh, interpret pricing um, in, in the form of reimbursement, just to have a very 50,000 foot level comprehension of how reimbursement works um, uh, from, a, from a price tier standpoint. And is, is there anything in the regulatory stance, for example, like let's say you're um, uh, moderate uh, complexity CLIA versus point of care that makes the work between the two of you very, very valuable for a company. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I can give you, I, I don't have an example off the top of my head of one with me and Michelle together, but I have an example that I think most people on this call will understand. I think it'll still answer your question. How ColoGuard came to market. So right. um, I don't, I'm not a ColoGuard fan. I think ColoGuard incentivizes healthy people that should be getting colonoscopies to wait till they get cancer. Bad idea. That's a great tagline. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that they'll ever put it on their website or commercials, but um, that's essentially what it's doing. You're 50 years old and you should be getting a colonoscopy, but you're not going to, and you're a you know, moderate to high risk for colon cancer. You're going to wait till you have blood in your stool. And then you're going to go find out that you could have got a polyp removed a year ago, but you waited until it turned into cancer. I'm not a fan of ColoGuard. I'm sorry. But they're an $11 billion company. They're doing something right, whether I like their product or not. Well, I'm, I just did some research for somebody the other day, and I think what we found is that they did the small study that the FDA required at the exact same time, they did a 9,800 patient prospective study, and they were published within like three months of each other. So what they did is they essentially, in so many words, talked to Michelle, and Michelle said, you need to do 483 patients, or whatever the number was, I can't remember. And then they talked to Nick, and Nick goes, you need to do 9,900 patients to get reimbursement. And they go, great, we'll do both. Now, I would love to say that Michelle and I were the ones that in charge of ColoGuard, but, but I'm, I'm very confident that's what they did. I, I have, in fact, this afternoon for this particular client, I got to go do some additional research on that. But I think that's what they did is, Michelle, what do you want? Great, we'll go get that to you. Nick, what do you want? And let's go run those two things at the same time because what's going to get us regulatory may not get us reimbursement. Do you think that this process of what you just described is going to happen more and more as the direct to consumer model starts to expand into the healthcare system? Yeah, and I, digital health is the thing, you know, for direct to consumer that's leading all of this. And uh, one of the things that I have a hard time with with pure digital health is it's still trying to get reimbursed. And, you know, I've got a list of, of examples where sometimes you can't avoid it. The digital health thing must be reimbursed. That is who the customer is. But I also go, man, if you're, if you're, if the point of your technology is to take 
a patient from having to go to the physician's office and letting them do this at home, don't try to get reimbursed. Just sell that on aisle five at Walmart. You know, just go direct to consumer. Sell it for $19.99 on TV. Um, you don't need Nick Anderson to do that, and you'll thank yourself if you don't need me. It, it's I'm going to have you spend millions and spend years, you know, doing all this stuff. Michelle, do you, did you have a comment too? I'm totally I, I did. So, so John, to, to to your point on the the regulatory side, you know, many of you know I I make the joke or the analogy of myself to a, a grief counselor, and I'm the regulatory grief counselor. Um, most of my clients are startups and are in very early stages, and they're still in that that they're still playing in the denial and anger phase of what it's going to really take to bring their their product to market, not just with the FDA, but with the, the reimbursement strategy. So unfortunately, most of my clients have been so narrow, narrow minded in, in terms of regulatory and reimbursement, but so in love with their, their science, their technology, and this is the next best thing to med tech since sliced bread, that, um, that, that, that they just aren't thinking this strategically early on to be able to really properly parallel path all, all of this at the same time. So that, that makes me think when you have the, the opposite, where you have very business-focused uh, clients and they're saying, Nick, am I going to make more money getting reimbursement or am I going to get more money trying to get through some hurdles that Michelle can help me with so that I can hit the consumer market and be in every Walmart and CVS in the in the world uh, you know is are you starting to see more and more of those types of discussions yeah and in fact I, just an email this morning before I joined this call I got one a company that has a very uh, direct to consumer product that could very super high tech. They just raised a ton of money a couple of weeks ago. And that could be a discussion to have with them is saying, do you guys really want reimbursement? Do you really want to play this game of hit pick, CPT, randomized prospective nonsense for a product that you could sell tomorrow with Michelle's blessing at aisle six at Walgreens? What? If you can do that, now you might make this much instead of this much, but you can make this much today. Um, and just one point to that, to where the regulatory and reimbursement strategy would, would overlap when you're trying to move from a, to a direct-to-consumer model. You know, uh, one thing that the, the FDA considers OTC a change in indications for use. And if your product, pro, your FDA product code isn't already indicated, for OTC use, you may be getting yourself into a situation where you have to do with other 510K um, and usability studies to demonstrate that a lay person can walk up to a shelf in the Walgreens, buy your device, and use it properly without hurting themselves and without the supervision of a, a physician or a clinician. Joe, so can I answer Jonathan's last question real quick before we go into it? So you asked about pricing. So I'm a big fan of the idea of evidence-based pricing. You know, evidence-based medicine was the big Dr. David Eddy concept of the early 90s. It's a funny term because what other type of medicine is there? I hope it's evidence-based, you know. But um, I've added the, the term, you know, evidence-based pricing. So you go to Michelle, you do the study that she requires, you get FDA approval, then you come to me. We continue the, the task of designing a clinical trial and doing everything to get Aetna, Cigna, Medicare to sign off. And with that data, we're then going to go do a cost of, birth, uh, cost of illness analysis. Um, okay. uh, or the, what is the burden of chronic kidney disease because your product is for chronic kidney disease. So once we know that, then we can price your product based off the evidence. So it's a return on investment for society? So it would be it would be more I take this 50 patients and this 50 patients they get your device they don't and I go look they had 17 emergency room visits and five kidney transplants but in your group that got this thing they only had two and two 
So this minus this plus this divided by this, all in the inpatient setting, so it's going to come out of the DRG, you should be charging $6,119 no more. Now, if board of directors will let you do a three-year long prospective study without knowing roughly what you're going to be charging, that's a different issue. The board's going to be like, you've got to pick a price now so that we know what your total addressable market is and we know what the market cap of the company is right now. And you can make up something in back of the envelope. We think we could charge four to five grand. You know, then you go do the study, then you do the health economics and you go, man, given the benefit that we're providing to Aetna and Cigna, we could be charging $6,142.63. But we're going to be good and come in at four grand and leave a little something on the table that greases the tracks for coverage. So evidence-based pricing is a very smart way because you didn't just make up the price. You did it based off of the outcomes that a cohort of 50 and 50 patients could expect to achieve with your device. Right. Before thank I you, ask thank Michelle you. for her perspective on that, Nick, I just sent you a quick note on Slack if you give that a look. Yeah. Michelle, um, what, what struck me as um, somewhat ironic in, in what you said before is your customers come to you and they're like, oh, 10, you know, I'm going to have to do these, this relatively small number of things to get it through FDA and they're like, oh, I'm in denial and grief. And uh, you may be counseling them. I guess you're not saying, you know, just wait till you leave my office. <laughs> it's baby, baby steps. Yeah. Um, it, well, and you know, people have trouble stomaching when I tell them that a 510K typically takes 80 to 120 hours to properly offer uh, review and prepare the, the e-copy and uh, and they have trouble stomaching that and I'm like okay this is like your shot at the FDA kind of uh, stamp and and you you, you think it's going to take less than a reasonable effort of two total weeks to to, to to do it properly and so like what do you think that that conversation with with Nick is going to be like early on if they think 80 hours to write a 510k is a lot. Our next contestant is Alan Cooper, who I'm now making a panelist because he has a question for you both. So um, instead of me reading it, Alan, show yourself and uh, let's see your question. Uh, with, uh, with more precision medicine, sorry, you had brought up evidence-based medicine, so it got me interested to ask this question. So with a precision-based medicine solution, so if I wanted to develop a, let's say, a 3D printed custom hip uh, implant, and that was my product, what would be some insights to know on the regulatory side for how would I even go about getting that through the FDA? Because as far as I know currently, or I know that would be tricky to get to the FDA if it's custom 3D printed and then reimbursement side. I have no idea how that would work as far as with that product, you're not necessarily proving out the product because it's a custom process of creating the hip implant. So I was just curious what insights you had on that. Well, from a regulatory perspective, that's definitely an area where the FDA is still developing their kind of thinking and positioning on it. It would be super important to make sure you know not only any guidance documents that are already out, but any that are, are in draft, any maybe public workshops they might have had, just so you can get an idea of where their, their thinking is at uh, on that technology. Um, something fascinating, because I'm working with a 3D uh, um, dental implant that has been on the market for a long time in the EU because under the MDD those didn't even require the uh, a, notif a technical file notified body uh, involvement. So it's hmm. recent, the, the regulation under MDR has recently changed uh, and, but it still doesn't require the level of oversight that a 3D printed dental implant is going to require for the, for, for the U.S. Um, so, so that would be important to understand the regulatory strategy to be able to inform your marketing strategy. You know, uh, most of the time, you guys have heard me like, right now, just don't try to go to Europe because it's the reg regulatory-wise is such a mess.
but this is one of those kind of rare exceptions where it may make sense to explore Europe first, despite the MDD and MDR debacle. Um, yeah, you said something else that, that I had a thought about, but I can't, it, it's gone, it's past now. Well, if it comes back interrupt. Um, so on the reimbursement side, I, I usually say this about diagnostic tests, Ellen, where though you can more acutely treat, though you can more acutely diagnose, can you more acutely treat? You know, and that's kind of the whole game with precision medicine and personalized medicine and all these, you know, 21st century idioms that have come about that, yes, I can, I can do a, I have the striker knee that I can pull off the shelf for total knee arthroplasty or hemiarthroplasty or total, you know, whatever total joint. And I'm going to get this outcome versus a 3D printed and I'm going to get, if you can see, I'm going to get this outcome, you know. <laughs> well, from a reimbursement perspective, if you're going to get a good outcome, we would look at it and say, okay, have you done the clinical trials? Have you shown, you know, safety and efficacy and all that kind of stuff? Um, how much are you charging for this? Because maybe that much of an improvement is one month, or I'll let, let's do six months of additional delaying of a revision surgery because of aseptic loosening. Well, six months pushing off an, an 85-year-old's total knee replacement is substantial. So um, maybe that 3D printed knee is actually worth something much uh, substantial, you know. Now, if, you're, if the total knee coming off the shelf is, you know, $10,000 and yours is $30,000 because it's precision medicine, well, you better be showing an additional, you know, $20,000 worth of benefit so you better be shoving off the revision surgery by an extra five or ten years, not by six months. So precision medicine has been, it's, it's what we all want. I mean, CRISPR is precision medicine. You know, all these new things is precision medicine. But from a reimbursement standpoint, it can be a real letdown. Because you go, yes, I can give that guy exactly what he needs, but really, it doesn't make a big clinical difference in the end if I would have just given them the off-the-shelf standard thing we've used for the last 10 years. Well, and, and you just, I've mentioned that same word or, or term throughout this call, clinical benefit. You know, it, it, and this, this might be an area where FDA says, well, that's great. Maybe it's safe and effective, but we don't really perceive any clinical benefit. So what's the point? Let me interject first. Sue, uh, go ahead and add yourself with your webcam. And two, I'm thinking as it relates to evidence, I, I don't know how you would aggregate the evidence of every 3D printed customized experience versus what if I just gave them the Zimmer implant. No, I'm not. What I would recommend is that if Alan's company, let's say it's, you know, hypothetical 3D printed knees or shoulders or whatever, do an RCT. Get, uh, get 50 patients, whatever the correct number, that have the off the shelf and then have Alan's company take another group of 50 patients that are going to have a TKA, total knee arthroplasty, and then compare the outcomes of the two after 48 months and go, look, those guys that got the 3D printed precision medicine total knee arthroplasty had 5% fewer of these, 22% fewer of those, and so on. And if you found equivalence, would, would a reimbursement agent yep. say, you know what, there was no statistically significant difference, so why am I paying more for this? And That's therefore, I'm not going to support it anymore? Don't pay more. So that would be a cost minimization analysis, not a cost effectiveness analysis. And we would say Alan's knee is non-inferior to the standard of care. Non-inferiority is a fantastic commercial go-to-market strategy to say we are no worse than the standard of care, but by the way, we're 20% less expensive. So that's the, that would be a gut-wrenching decision for Alan, Alan's board of directors to go, dang it, we did the study and we're not, we don't have superior outcomes. Can we still do these 3D printed knees instead of $10,000? Can we do them for five? Undercut striker and go to market with a non-inferiority 
strategy. That that could totally work. Hmm. Mr. FDA, do you have a well, I listen to Nick and Michelle. You can understand why people don't pick regulatory or reimbursement for careers. <laughs> uh, no, this is a question that has to do with the medical economics. Uh, it's it's obvious uh, from a reimbursement standpoint there are things important that aren't necessarily important to FDA. The question is, have you ever developed a protocol with a device company where you, Nick, have taken a look at it and said, okay, this the procedural cost. We need to get a better grasp on procedural costs and ancillary equipment, hospital stay, um, you know, read, you know, follow up, whatever, and and then have a study that's got clinical significant endpoints that satisfies FDA, but also has a lot of economic data in it to show that it's it's a good deal and should be reimbursed. Have you ever have done? Have you ever had input on a protocol design? Yeah, and in fact, I'm doing one as we speak and just submitted one to a company just a few days ago. And it was exactly what you just described, Larry. And I spent four years on Intermountain Healthcare's Value Analysis Committee, the VAC. And we would, so I've been on the other side of the table too, where I'm the one reviewing this for Intermountain Healthcare going, not, not as a payer, I was also a payer, but on the hospital side of that job that I had for seven years, going, wait a minute, guys, you're selling us capital equipment and you're trying to price this and do health economics as though you're disposable, you know, and, and have some funny discussions. I mean, some of these roundtables were really kind of funny about these companies that had raised 50 million bucks and were missing the mark entirely. And so, sorry for the roundabout answer, but yes, that if I had to sum up what most companies come to me for, it's to do exactly that and to say, look, will you work with our biostatistician and let's go pull the literature and make sure that we're hitting the endpoints that are going to be most significant to either the hospital or the insurance company, depending who our customer is. If it's capital equipment, it's the hospital. Thanks. Sue? Hi, uh, I had a question. If you have a, a new device, then, and there are two predicate devices you're comparing it to for your 510k clearance. How do you, if you know, for reimbursement, how do you come up with a new code? So, those, I, I see those as two separate things. So, you're saying if, if you have a product, there's already a, when you say predicate, you're talking Michelle's language. I don't really care about predicates from a reimbursement standpoint, but I would say if there, if go to Alan Cooper's question and it, hypothetical technology of a total knee arthroplasty that's 3D printed, precision medicine designed just for you versus an off the shelf one, that the payer would do what's called an HTA, a health technology assessment. There's information like you wouldn't believe online about HTAs. Uh, there's HTA review organizations like NICE and Cochrane and Hayes and C. And they would look at the standard of care's data and say, what do you, what is the standard outcome I could expect after a total knee arthroplasty at 36, 48, and 60 months? And they, you know, here's, here's what I expect on aseptic loosening and, you know, uh, revision surgeries and so on. Now let's look at Sue's outcomes, and we're going to compare those. So to use the term predicate, I know that you were just, you know, that, that's the term in the regulatory world. In the reimbursement world, we just say standard of care. So the standard of care would be the off-the-shelf total knee that Stryker and Medtronic have been making for a million years. Uh, and how does your technology compare to the outcomes we would expect to get from that? And if you go do that study and you see that you're non-inferior, meaning you're equivalent, you're just as good as them, then you better charge less. So you have a good cost utilization and cost minimization analysis. If you're more expensive and you're not as good, you're dead in the water. What if you're better? If you're better, go ahead and charge a few more bucks. You know, and that's where... You have to, to, have, the you have, to have the data in the healthcare economy study to prove it. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Domino. 
our well-appointed friend. <laughs> you know what I especially loved is when you got on camera, your your tie was off just a little like. <laughs> it's a, it's a mirror. So the call is a mirror for yourself as well. So I saw the tie. Uh, but this question actually is for Nick. Uh, Nick, what if there's what would be your reimbursement plan for a a device, a therapeutic device? which has had a 510K since 2008, but is now and was primarily used in elective surgeries, but now is being more used in uh, non-elective surgeries where hospitals are using it more widely, where now they're looking for reimbursement. But unfortunately, it doesn't have a specific HICSPICS code. So I would start there. Um, you know, we, we'd have to, I'd have to know a little bit more about exactly what the technology is. I, I don't know that it would make too much of a difference off the top of my head about it being elective versus non-elective surgery, um, it would be the essentially the indications for use. A, again, another Michelle, more of a Michelle term. You know, what was it initially reimbursed for? You know, if it was reimbursed for appendectomy, uh, emergency appendectomies or something, and insurance companies have been paying, and now if they're pivoting, no, that wouldn't be an elective surgery. Man, that's a bad no, example. Well, I'll, I'll give you the example. It's It was primarily used, it's a, a non-invasive therapy device for reducing pain. The indication is for reduction of pain and edema in post-operative tissue. So in plastic surgery, those are all elective procedures, and there's been thousands and thousands of uses in plastic surgery. But now recently, since it reduces the need for opioids, it's being used in operatives, uh, operations, uh, you know, such as C-sections and others, which are, you know, not elective. So the, the question is, how now do you go about getting reimbursement for now these uses? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. That, that helps that clarification. So again, it would be proving it. I, it so pain reduction is a really tricky, tricky thing. I, that is a, I've worked with a couple of companies that have you know, analgesic type, uh, like uh, infusion pumps and things like that. And that's hard because the showing the clinical utility and health economics of reducing pain in the post-operative setting is is very difficult well let me, let me just if i could just interject there was an rct that was done and published in peer-reviewed journal which showed a 200 percent reduction in the use of post-operative pain medications in the treated versus the sham group so in that then at that point i would say your customer is the hospital because pain medications are cheap an insurance company is going to be like look uh, you know, a shot of this or a shot of that after surgery is cheap. It's already bundled in the APC grouper, the the bundled bill or the DRG. Right. Uh, it doesn't come out of our pocket. It comes out of them, out of their pocket. Go ask them to reimburse you. Meaning, you have your customer at that point would be the hospital's value analysis committee. It's not going to be the payer. So you'd have to go to them and and make that argument to them because after a, a total shoulder. Um, you know, say a same day surgery, uh, hemiarthroplasty or something like that. They're gonna, the patient's gonna show up for surgery at 8 a.m. They're gonna have the surgery at 10. They're gonna be in post op until four o'clock, and they're gonna be home by dinner. Well, all of that is gonna be bundled into one bill, ten thousand bucks. Period. That's what the insurance company is gonna see. Now, if your company has a pain reduction thing that's gonna eat twenty dollars out of that or two hundred dollars out of that bundled bill. The insurance company goes, look, we don't really care. Very rarely do we care. Um, go talk to the ambulatory surgical center. Go talk to the hospital outpatient department. They're your customer. If they're willing to eat that $200 out of their bundled bill, they can knock themselves out. Got it. Okay, understood. So you, you wouldn't need insurance. This would, be a, this would be an issue between you and the value analysis committee. 